looking at you, kid. That's the rumor. Nobody puts baby in a corner. Get away from her, you bitch! I'll have what she's having. You move, Chief. I've been poor my whole life. Not true. I'm going to kill you in one minute, man. That is extremely rude. Funny how. You can't handle the truth! Not, not quite my tempo. Mm -hmm. Is this your homework, Larry? Well, this is necessary of yours. Where I'm from. No fighting. And here we go. Hey, everybody. This is Brayden and my guy from This Is Reviewable. Today we're going to talk about stuff. What are we going to talk about, my guy? Okay, so we watched the movie Living. Came out last year. Do you want to give a synopsis? Yes, I would love to give a synopsis. Hang on, let me just pull up my notes. Should I do the whole No, I don't like place? it. <laughs> Summary. Mr. Williams is a workaholic who has become trapped in a cycle of apathy towards everything in life. When he gets the news from his doctor that he has six months to live, he goes on a soul-searching journey to discover how he wants to spend his remaining days. And that's what this is about. And it stars Bill Nighy, the science guy he. Um, you might know him from such projects as About Time. He plays the dad in About Time. Uh, you may know him from Pirates of the Caribbean. He's Davy Jones, but you won't recognize his face because he doesn't look like a squid. In this he movie. is? Yeah. Oh, I had no idea. Uh, what else is he in? He's, he's like, he does a lot of cameo stuff. I know he's in Love Actually. I know he's in... Hot Fuzz, and he's in Shaun of the Dead, but like he's in really small parts in those movies. I almost guarantee you've seen him before, though. He's in a lot of a lot of stuff. I know that we have. He's in Rango. Oh, is he Rattlesnake Jake? Yeah, I think he is. Jack the Giant Slayer, Hot Fuzz, Harry Potter, and the Deathly Hollows Part One. Yeah, he's barely in that. Emma. Oh, he's the dad of Emma. He's in Detective Pikachu? Maybe he's the guy that wants to turn into a Pokemon. Oh. Remember that? In Detective Pikachu? Not really. Yeah, he's like trying to transform himself into a Pokemon. G-Force? Did you watch that movie? No. It was true. The Hamsters? Yeah. We had very different opinions about this movie, I think. Why don't you give yours first? I thought this movie was very boring. Mm -hmm. I think that they're... So this movie's very slow-paced... But also not at the same time, I feel like. Because the story is very simple. He finds out he has six months to live, and then he dies. So you're saying it moves along quickly. But also, the parts that are slow are really, really slow. Because he doesn't have... He's the manager of this team at work. At, at like, City Hall, basically, yeah. of London. He works for the city. He doesn't really talk to his employees, and his employees are kind of scared of him. And at some point, he becomes friends with one of his employees, and they spend a lot of time together talking. And th these scenes of them just sitting talking are so slow. And, like, they're very artsy, and I just didn't really like them. Micah hates art. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she hates talking. Always. You're in the wrong business, baby. <laughs> Yeah, it is very slow. It's not... This movie is definitely not going to be for everybody. It's very um, contemplative. That's the word I would describe it as. Because he's... it's This guy is just trying to figure out what to do with the rest of his life. Because he's become this just kind of zombie. That's what the um, his friend, his employee that he becomes friends with, she tells him that, oh, it's your dinner time again. Yummy! Yay! <laughs> I guess you don't get that much. No, the middle of the day is just a snack. Yeah, that was like five pebbles of cat food. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all you have for your snack? <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's enough. Do you want to take it now or do you want to just... I'll take it later. Okay. The uh, employee calls him Mr. Zombie. That's her nickname for him. And that's basically what he has become. And so the whole, the movie is him trying to figure out what he's going to do with the time he has left. And there's not any action that's happening. You know, he's just he's just going through his own little personal journey. Did you have anything you liked about it? There were a couple funny moments. So, Bill Nighy's character is called Mr. Williams. Yeah. 
and he lives in this flat with his son and his son's wife and at some point the son and the wife are talking about how they need to bring up some scandalous thing it's basically a scandal that they just need to have a conversation with him yeah about whatever and the son the whole time is like i'm gonna talk to him i'll do it i want it's gonna be a good conversation and then mr williams comes in for dinner and and he's preparing to have a big conversation too like he's trying to work up the courage yeah to to like start this heavy conversation with his son about his diagnosis and then they start dishing up dinner and neither of them say anything yeah and the wife is like are you kidding me yeah you're (laughs) and she tries to like instigate it and bill nye he's like "Hmm, yes quite quite true (laughs) they're they're just it was just funny because they're like both the same person basically yeah what did you like i'll try and think of it um i actually liked a lot i thought the cinematography was very beautiful and bill nye he is really good yeah in this movie He's always really good, but he was, like, really good in this. The The girl that he becomes friends with, also, from his work, is really good. Yeah. Um, and then his there's a, there are a couple of scenes that are just, like, really powerful, I thought. Um, there's a scene where his son is talking to the girl from work. Her name is Margaret. Um, there's a scene where the son and Margaret are talking. That, I'm not going to give anything away about the context of it but that scene is really good i don't know if this is that big of a spoiler um but williams just mr williams decides to confide in margaret what's going on in his life and that scene it sounds like micah didn't like that scene i really really liked that that part because that at the beginning of the movie he tries like the like stereotypical I'm dying, so now I'm going to finally go live. So, you know, he goes and gets drunk and goes to, like, a little striptease show. And Mm -hmm. um, he's going to – he goes to a carnival. I think they're – it's, like, in Brighton or something on the coast of England. I'm assuming. So this is set in the 1950s, by the way. So it's a little bit older. Like, it looks old. They did a really good job making this look like it's from the 1950s. Um, Even though it came out in – 2022 but he you know he goes through the whole stereotypical i'm gonna eat drink and be merry and that you can tell like he's not fulfilled by that like that that wasn't the answer to how he wants to spend his last couple of months on the earth and then when he has and when he has the conversation with margaret you can tell that's when he understands what he wants to do with the rest of his time and then from then um, the movie focuses on on what he chooses to do, and it like is actually quite uh, meaningful. Like, there's layers to this. It's like an onion. It's like Shrek. Living is like onions. There's a, there's a lot to dig into. I think. Yeah, except I think Shrek is better. Yeah, I mean, yeah, probably, but it's a I di- do agree kind of thing. that this makes this movie makes you think about how you're spending your life like what you could be doing better yeah and what i came up with was that we should probably travel more oh really is that what you came up with yeah from this movie and you you didn't come up with it any other time no only this time watching this movie (laughs) okay so this movie did have an impact on you so that's interesting because i got the impression that we should travel less from this movie oh interesting so where do we go from here I think we should compromise and travel more. That doesn't sound like a compromise <laughs> at all. That just sounds like we're going to do your thing. Yeah, that's a compromise. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. Haven't you ever heard of it? You know what my impression was from this movie? Hmm. Um, we should build cubicles in our house and just sit in those cubicles more often. Something that was... I would go. I would be so claustrophobic inside this office that they're working in, because mm-hmm. all of their desks are pushed right up against each other. There's no space in between yeah. all the subordinates' desk. Yeah. And then there's it's like open floor plan, very modern. This, this is triggering me. I need space. I need space from this. Four 
there's like four inches between the subordinates mass of desks and mr williams desk slightly bigger desk yeah yeah and they all have massive piles of paper yeah um yeah yeah that would be a nightmare to work in that environment for sure i don't know i thought this was really good i thought it was i'm not i have a lot of notes here but i feel like if i talk about most of them i'll be spoiling things this is a this is a sort of message that i got from it it's important to learn how to be satisfied with the small things that you do in life, the small things that you accomplish in life. Um, because a lot of the things that you accomplish in life won't last forever, but that doesn't make it not valuable. So if you think about, I don't know, think about some of the things you're proud of in your life. Like I, for ex I mean, we got married, right? That was, that was cool. But eventually we'll die and eventually our friends will will die and the people that knew us will die and the people that are living on the earth at that point won't they won't have known us but that doesn't make our lives not important you know yeah it this this um i'm not doing a good job of giving an example of well like when we decided that we wanted a cat and then we found graham yeah it's a huge impact on his life and ours and ours yeah but, like, it's not going to have a huge impact on anyone else's life. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's not important. Um, and Yeah, well, and, like, taking, like, realizing that, like, the things that are important to other people, even if it's not important to you, it's still important because it's important to them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's... And that it means a lot to help them accomplish something that's important to them. Yeah. And they'll remember it for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And... It was, I really liked seeing this kind of, this zombie of a dude completely change everyone's perception of him with the time, the short time that he had left to live. And it's like, it's poignant to think about that. You can, you know, you, there's always time to do something good. This movie really points out the fact that it knows it's going to have an impact on people and that it's going to make one make people want to change mm -hmm. the way that they're living their life and then how quickly people forget that yeah because the end of the movie people real basically what i just said like we're gonna change and we're gonna remember this thing that happened yeah and then immediately the next scene the guy just throws it out the window yeah i thought that was really i really liked that actually yeah that or, was originally i had um so at a certain point his co-workers um, decide that they're going to follow his example and, and be more like him um, because they, they all notice that he changes and he's not the same person and they all kind of take turns as they're on the way to work because he never rides with them in the train. They're always in their own separate um, little cabin. Compartment. Um, right, compartment. And they all take turns describing like things that they witnessed that proved to them that he was different. That he became different. The one guy says, let's make a pledge to live more like him. And I was like, that, that's kind of lame. I think that's better left unsaid that they wanted to change. But only it only like really resonates with one of them. Mm -hmm. And I really liked that because I think what that is showing is like, you have this group of people that said that they were going to live a certain way. But... Like at the end of the day, in order to actually live that way, you have to be motivated from the inside. Yeah. You have to want to. Like you can't just rely on the fact that you made a promise with a bunch of other people. Like you need to want to live a better life in order to actually do it. Yeah. And so you see, you see every coworker except for one forget about their you know, their New Year's resolution. It, 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 they didn't all forget. Because it was three guys that did th that made this pledge. Yeah. One of them is the one that initiated it. Yeah. And then the other one is the one who actually listened. And then the other one, the third guy, if the one who actually wanted it to happen had been more outspoken, I think the third guy would have followed. So, I mean, there's, there's layers to dig into that, too. Yeah. Like, what do you think that means? I, I feel like you could have a conversation just about that. Yeah. You know, like, is it important, you know, maybe some people do need an example 
and other people just need to be intrinsically motivated. And there's layers to this, I'm telling you. Okay. The more that we're talking about this, the better it seems. It, it was just hard to sit through. Yeah. Because it was so slow. And, like, there are movies, I can't think of one right now, there are movies that are at a slow pace and, like, artsy. Like, Pride and Prejudice. Yeah. They have parts that are really slow. Yeah. And it's not boring. Right. This, the parts where they're, like, talking and, like, just music playing. I thought it was boring. But the message is really good. They did try to make this feel mundane. Yeah. Like, real life. Which I appreciated. Yeah. I. It's not, like, um, it's not puffed up. Mm-hmm. It just feels, it feels like a real thing that could have happened. Yeah. We didn't do our famous segment. I'm sorry. Yeah. Our famous segment, trivia for young, jolly good chaps. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, so Bill Nighy confessed that despite numerous opportunities, he has not seen the finished film. He doesn't like watching himself on screen and hasn't watched most of his films. Wow. Yeah, so he's one of those. One of those actors that doesn't watch himself. I think Johnny Depp is another one. Hmm. They just don't like watching themselves. So this is based on a Japanese film. This is a remake of a Japanese film called Ikiru. And it was made by Kurosawa. So that's a little fun fact. Okay. Um, in this movie, there's a song that Mr. Williams sings when he's going on his, like, his sort of eat, when he's in his eat, drink, and be merry era. His eat, pray, love moment. His, yeah, his eat, pray, love era. <laughs> um, there's a there's a part where he starts singing a song in a pub, and you can tell the song is, like, personal to him. Um, and he sings it again later in the movie at a very important part, and I'm not going to spoil it, but I thought that part was really good, too, the second yeah. time he sings it. Um, and the song is The Rowan Tree, and... It is a Scottish song about a man named Rodney Williams who looks back on his life. He thinks about being a child, like the rowan tree leaves in spring. He thinks about the good times, like the white clusters of flowers on the rowan tree in summer. And you can, having watched the movie and having listened to the things that Mr. Williams talks about, how he wants to be more like a child that's playing than the zombie that he's become that that song really matches with yeah with his mindset so i thought that was kind of cool and that concludes our famous segment trivia for yon jolly good chaps okay what would you rate this um i'm gonna give this eight chili swing sets out of ten oh. i do think i think it has a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to unpack it's very nuanced it's very poignant it is slow though and it's not something that i feel like i could watch over and over again mm -mm. but i but i thought it was really good okay so initially i rated this a one out of ten but after talking about this i think i'm gonna change it to a four. Oh my gosh <laughs> and so i wrote down <laughs> good hell woman <laughs> that is so low for this <laughs> Okay, fine. Maybe a five. Napoleon, I get, but like, <laughs> Okay, I rated this. I wasn't sure if you were going to steal my rating, so I wrote down two ratings. Okay. So I rated this now a five out of ten. Fuck teeths. These are great. The dashier, the better. Nice. But... I was worried you might also say that one. So I also wrote down 5 out of 10, do better communicating with your people, friends or family, so that they aren't blindsided. You read a book, didn't you? Oh, I read a book. Yeah, I read a book. You read a book? Finally. I know. What book is this that you've read in your life? What so I read? read the book, The Queen's Gambit, which is what the TV show is based off of. What's a, t what's a TV? So I think that the... TV show does a really, really good job of following the book. Mm -hmm. It's basically exactly the book. But the book is about this you know, orphan, Beth Harmon. And she becomes an orphan when I think she's eight. 
she gets sent to this orphanage that is a religious orphanage, a Methowin orphanage. Methowin? Methowin is what it's called. Yeah. And she, it's supposed to be set in the 60s, and they give their orphans tranquilizers to meth. like sedate them. And they gave Beth some meth. Beth becomes addicted to these tranquilizers. And then at some point they take them away because the state realizes what these orphanages are doing. And so while she's there, she meets the janitor, Mr. Scheibel, and he teaches her how to play chess. And she's really good at playing chess and loves it. And then eventually she leaves the orphanage and gets adopted. And becomes a chess prodigy and travels the world playing chess. And I think, I feel like this book is a little bit slow, but that's okay because it's about chess and chess is slow. I don't know. I think chess is boring, but that's just me. Yeah, but you hate slow stuff. Remember? I know. Remember from the last review we did just now? Uh-uh. You hate it. I actually really like slow stuff. That's my favorite thing. So you like tortoises? Yeah. How do you feel about sloth? Love them. Really? Yeah. Would you give one a big old hug? Yep. That's fair. They're kind of scary, though. But they do look kind of cuddly to hug, don't you think? Yeah. Um, okay, so one of the major things that was different from the show, the show did not do this, and I'm glad that they didn't. When Beth is in the orphanage, she's like eight or nine, um, she becomes friends with this black girl her name is jolene and jolene is several years older than her like three or four years older than her and one night beth is like almost asleep or she gets woken up by jolene touching her Mm. and beth says i don't like this stop and jolene is like no it's fine you do it back Mm. and so beth is like a literal child and like does it back and then they just never touch on that topic ever again and then they're not friends for a while and then they become friends again and then like they're friends throughout their whole life which is just i don't i didn't like that made me feel so uncomfortable i hated it Mm -hmm. hated that they put that in the book because did it happen because this is a true story right no this isn't a true story this is fiction oh the other thing about this book was so beth is like obviously a genius when it comes to chess Mm. she's very very intuitively good at chess but can she do it on a cold rainy night in stoke what's stoke is that a place soccer fans will understand yeah and she kind of has an addictive personality it seems like where she is addicted to these tranquilizers and ends up taking them throughout the whole book and she's an alcoholic and knows this about herself. And at some point, like, she really tries to stop drinking. And, yeah. you know, addicts always, not always, often relapse. I just feel like a lot of really smart people have substance abuse problems. Not everybody. But I just wonder if there's, like, a correlation between that. Yeah, they just think they think too much, maybe, and they get depressed. There's a, I feel like a lot of highly intelligent people are nihilistic too i don't know why do you think that is i think they just think too much they can't stop they can't stop uh they can't turn it off a lot of them are are hyper skeptical um yeah i just think they can't turn it off which is really sad yeah but also you know it almost is like their suffering brought us so much good in a lot of times. I don't know. Like, just really smart people uh, yeah. create really useful tortured, things. Tortured people. Yeah. Yeah, like the atomic bomb. You understand what I'm saying, though? Yeah. And it just is like, is it worth it for them, them to suffer so much and be or- in pain or be addicted? Oh, I just thought of a good example. Alan Turing, he was a genius, but yeah. like he, I guess, I don't know. All I know about him is from the imitation game, but, mm-hmm. but that's an example. Like he had a rough life, but we wouldn't have computers without him. 
and we wouldn't have, you know, he played a big part in defeating the Nazis too. Yeah. Or like Albert Einstein, wasn't he kicked out of school? Was that him? Uh, he might have been. I know he was, uh, he wasn't a math guy. He was a more of like a theoretical physicist, sort of like Oppenheimer was. Yeah. I don't know. He He's like famous for saying God doesn't play dice with the universe or whatever, whatever that quote is. So he was religious, which makes me, I, I don't know that much about his life, but it makes me think that he had some sort of purpose. Like he wasn't a nihilist. He wasn't like lost sort of in in the world, not knowing what he believed in. Or Stephen Hawkins. Hawking. Hawk, whatever it is. What is it? Stephen Hawking. Hawking. Stephen F- Hawkinson. About how he basically proved that God was real and then spent so much time proving that God wasn't real. He came up with a proof for why God is real. Yeah. And then disproved it. Yeah. Yeah. And that like was really hard on his marriage, him doing that. Yeah. Yeah. See, he just, he, he just can't stop. Yeah. Can't turn it off. He can't, he can't enjoy just a, a simple life. Yeah. And there's a lot of people like that. Just sounds exhausting. Yeah. I don't know. Nihilists. Nihilists. <laughs> me. Time for our famous sec- segment. Investigation for education. That's a famous segment, all right. <laughs> so Heath Ledger, before he died, was actually working on an adaptation of The Queen's Gambit. Beth? Guess who would have played Beth? Uh, Heath Ledger? Nicole Kidman? No. Elliot Page. Really? Yeah. Yeah, she like... could have done well. I think she could have done well. Really? I think it would have been weird. Or he, I guess. Yeah, he. But at the time, she. he was she. Right. So she, I don't know. I think that would have been so crazy, and Heath Ledger would have been in it. I wonder how it would have been different. Who would he have played? He could have played Benny Watts, the friend that lives in New York. The really skinny guy from the show? Mm-hmm. Okay. The I one think... that wears, like, a weird hat and gloves all the time? Mm-hmm. He's just a quirky dude. Yeah. Yeah. He would have directed it and acted in it. That would have been interesting to see. Yeah. I would recommend this book. I'm giving it an 8.5 orphans with pill problems who end up being chess champions. Mm. Not specific at all. Yeah. <laughs> Very universally used. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. Frequently. Yeah. Every, you know, every town is always bragging about their orphan turned <laughs> pill addict that becomes a chess champion. Exactly. Yeah. So I really liked the book. If you have a hard time reading books or listening to the audiobook or anything, like just watch the show. So they did a really good job of staying true to the book. Yeah. But I also am glad that I read the book. You know. So did you read anything? No. Did you watch anything? I got I got a video game to talk about briefly. Because I'm gonna do a separate video on this. Um so I'm I'm gonna go over this quick. This game is Cuphead. So this came out in twenty seventeen. Here's the summary that I wrote. Cuphead and his brother Mugman are gambling at the Devil's Casino. After Cuphead loses... Classic. Gambling at the Devil's Casino. That's right. After Cuphead loses a reckless bet, they find themselves fighting the various debt dodgers on the Inkwell Isles to enforce the Devil's will as repayment for their own debt. This may... Oh. Okay, I guess this is part of the summary. This may sound... Satsnick... That was a typo. Satanic is what I meant. (laughs) Um, But it is as charming as games come, and I wouldn't be concerned about playing it. The devil is straight up a cartoonized version of himself and not scary at all. Yeah, he's not scary. Yeah, this didn't feel uncomfortable at all to play, even though it sounds like, you know, oh, you know, made a deal with the devil or whatever. I feel like Cult of the Lamb is worse than this one. Yeah. Um, Okay, what did I like about this game? The art style... The animation, the music, they go for this 1930s style old cartoons. If you've ever seen Steamboat Willie, the old Mickey Mouse cartoon where he's whistling Mm -hmm. and like steering the ship. That's what this looks like, except colorized. Um, And then the music is awesome. 
the gameplay is really challenging but very satisfying and I'm debating putting footage just to give you like a little taste of what this looks like because I am going to make a special video about this game where there's going to be footage and I'm going to talk in greater detail about what I love about it. Um, so I'm, there might be footage here, there might not be. But definitely keep an eye out for the full, the real review, the real YouTube video that I'm making. Dislikes, if I'm really nitpicking, this game is split up into... Um, basically, it's basically just you fight a bunch of bosses, but also there are these segments where you try to just make it to the end of the level, and they're called run and gun segments. Um, and the point of them is to get money so that you can buy like power ups and stuff. If I'm really nitpicking, some of the run and gun sections felt like they were just a stepping stone so that I could get back to the real game. Just filler. Yeah. Um, but but they're also like it's all just so beautiful that like it's really hard to dislike any of it um okay famous segment the devil's in the details uh this game took seven years to make and was Whoa. nearly canceled due to financial difficulties that would be so sad yeah it was made by two brothers two brothers in a van um <laughs> So the two brothers who made it had always wanted to make a video game since they were kids, but they both went to school, graduated, got jobs in different fields, forgot about it. And then after Super Meat Boy was released, which is another indie game, they got inspired. And then after that, they decided to make it. Wow. So thank you, Super Meat Boy. Um, also, there is a Cuphead show on Netflix. And I think this... it's rated like Y7 or something. Yeah, it's a kid's show. Yeah. Yeah. It's not bad. We watched a couple episodes. Yeah. It's not It's not bad. We didn't finish it, but it was yeah. decent. Um, and that concludes our famous segment, The Devil's in the Details. Okay. What's my rating, you ask? 10 Goopy Legrands out of 10. <laughs> Even though this game made you so incredibly mad? Yep. It'll make you mad. Yeah, Brayden was not allowed to play this game for a while. Because it made him so mad. Yeah. But uh, I persevered, and I have beaten all of it and the DLC, so... Okay. Yeah. All right, move on to separate stuff. Yeah, okay. So I watched the movie Dungeons & Dragons. A rewatch for ye. Yeah. It was good. So this movie is about Ed, who is a harper. This is Chris Pine. This is Chris Pine. Okay. He's a harper, which I think basically is like the police, because he goes out and he like arrests people and is basically a civil servant. And he's a harper, and then these red wizards, Thayans, come and kill his wife. And so he has to raise his daughter alone. After his wife dies, he's super depressed, starts drinking a ton, and like... They show him in the bar, like in the pub, drinking a ton, just plastered with his baby just sitting right there next to him. And this woman... And, and it's funny, but not sad. It is sad, but it's also funny. Okay. She, like, he, like, the baby's, like, in a car seat, basically. The medieval, quote-unquote, car seat. So you would say, sadly, it's funny? Yeah. Or it's so funny it made you sad? No, sadly, it's funny. Okay. And... This woman, Holga, takes pity on the both of them, and they become, Ed and Holga become best friends. There's no romantic anything. They're like brother and sister is what they say. Mm -hmm. And Holga helps raise Kira, the daughter. Yeah. And Ed no longer is a... Mighty Christian of her. (laughs) Ed is no longer a harper, and they start just making money stealing things. Mm. So they kind of have like a little gang. And Hugh Grant is in this movie. Oh, yeah. His name is Forge, and he's in their little gang. And Forge tells Ed... Are you spoiling things right now? This is the very beginning of the movie. Tells um, Ed that there's this tablet of reawakening, which basically could bring his wife back. And they have to go and break into 
this really oh a harper stronghold and because ed did the oath even though he doesn't follow it anymore he could get them inside the stronghold and so they go there and they're trying to steal it long story short holga and ed get captured and they get put into prison Mm -hmm. forge takes care of kira and so the movie that's like the first the very beginning of the movie and holga and ed are in prison and they break out to go and get kira because Forge has been taking care of her, and Forge is like the mayor of the city now. Whoville. Yeah. Never winter. And so the story is Kira's upset at Ed. Ed is trying to get her back, and like all this, and there's conflict. And okay. So the first time I watched this movie, I thought it was really cheesy. I thought some of the lines didn't hit super well, and it was just kind of forced. The second time I watched this, I thought it was a very fun movie and yeah. the lines didn't feel as cheesy. It felt just like a fun, good time. Yeah. So not cheesy. What's the opposite of cheesy? Meaty. Meaty? You think? Mm, sweetie. So let's see what the internet thinks. No answer. Meritorious. I don't like that at all. Um, well, let's just go with whatever you said, sweetie. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this movie was sweetie. It was weird seeing Hugh Grant be not the love interest or the super nice guy. Well, he's in Paddington too, remember? Who is he? He's the villain, the antagonist. In the second one? Yeah. It's been a while since I watched that one. But I just mean, like, some of my favorite movies that he's in, he's the love interest. Or he's the super nice guy that gets shafted because he's such a nice guy. Right. And it was weird seeing him be not that. Like, I almost didn't like it. Really? <laughs> yeah. It was... ruined your perception of Hugh Grant? <laughs> a little bit, even though he's not even that bad of a guy. It's just, I mean... He did have that interview that people got mad at him for, or whatever. When that interviewer, he just wasn't giving, like, good answers, but also the interviewer was asking him, like, just these... Oh, yeah, what movie? Was that for this movie? These absolute soggy crackers of of questions. Yeah. What does it feel like to be in Glass Onion? It was such an amazing film. I really loved it. I love a thriller. How fun is it to shoot something like that? Well, I'm barely in it. I'm in it for about three seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you can't blame the guy. He has to deal with questions. Yeah, he was, like, answering exactly what the question was. Yeah. Um, FYI, not my fault. No, no, no. Or something like that, and people were getting upset. Yeah. I forgot about that. So now it's time for our famous segment, mm-hmm. Intelligence. I'm so glad we started doing this. Yes, Intelligence with Evidence to Convince. What? <laughs> I just looked up words that rhymed okay. with Intel. And Intel is intelligence. Okay. That's, that's the intelligence I was talking about. Okay. So before this movie was made, the cast and crew of the D&D movie played an hours long game of D and D to help like people that didn't know yeah. whatever very method. Yeah. Learn about the game, mm-hmm. which the thing I was reading was like, it just got, it was basically a big improv and things people would just throw out the craziest things. Yeah. And then the next person's turn would be Chris Pine. And he would just be like, uh, what's, the, what do you always call yourself in games? Me? Yeah, you. Colonel Mustard? No, where you just like to... Goblin mode. Like, if you played D&D, you would just... Uh, I like to poke buttons. Yeah, but... Push buttons. I like to wind people up. I like to stir the pot. Yeah, he's basically... I'm in goblin mode. While Micah's looking up whatever she's looking up, highly recommend playing Risk with with uh, people that you know well. And as the game goes on, just start pushing their buttons during risk it's really fun to do but you don't want to like you don't want to play with people that you know will get so mad that it'll it'll become not fun just play with people that you know you can you can wind up it's a okay lot, it's this a lot is of fun. this is what one of the cast members said he goes you think of the wildest craziest thing you can do and then you have the privilege of having Chris Pine sit next to you and he'll take that and run with it and blow it up and make it crazier <laughs> Oh, you gotta love Chris Pine. Yeah, you yeah. have to. He's great. Okay. So, the next thing was that Bradley Cooper has a cameo in this. Okay. Apparently, in the original 
filming. He wasn't in the movie. But they sent him... They basically sent him an offer, like, we want you to be in this. But they sent him a copy of the movie, and he watched it. And yeah. he was like, texted the director. Yeah. And was like, I'm in. And the director was like, who's this? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, it's BC. Bradley Cooper. Before Christ. Um, I'm in, or whatever like that. Yeah. And then the director starts laughing, and he calls him. And he's like, awesome, we're so happy that you're in, or whatever. So the character that played Zank, who, I don't want to ruin it, but he... Do you mean the actor that played Zank? Yeah. Trump card, you misspoke. Okay, my bad. I win. Okay. So... Flawless victory. So the actor Paige, who played Zank in the movie, did a little bit of improvising. In this, in this one specific thing that's mentioned made me laugh because there's this part. He's just a very straightforward guy. He doesn't understand irony. Yeah, so he's Drax, basically. Yeah. Okay. But like a less obnoxious version of that. I don't mind Drax. He helps them with something. And then as he's leaving, he starts walking in a completely straight line. And Chris Pine is like, wow, look at him go. Just walking in a straight line. Oh, look. He's come upon a boulder. What's he going to do? Oh, he's going to go right over it. And apparently he wasn't supposed to go right over it. He was supposed to go around it. But because this guy is so straightforward, he's walking a straight line and the boulder's in his way. So he just walks right over it. They also on set had a D&D expert to make sure that things were following the rules. But they also said... Did he wear glasses and have braces and two big buck teeth? And then and had a ton of acne, probably. And then whenever someone made a mistake, he's like, actually, you can't do that. Probably. But they did say that if it was between following the rules of D&D and moving the movie plot forward, yeah. they followed the movie plot. So it's not okay. 100% correct, the whole movie. Okay. But that ends our famous segment, <clears throat> Intelligence with Evidence to Convince. That is a famous segment we do. Yeah, we love that one. Yeah. You didn't give your score. Oh, I didn't give my score. Right. Okay, my score for this movie this movie was 8.5 Pudgy Dragons. That's pretty high. Yeah, the second showing made it better. It's just a fun movie. Yeah. It's a good time. Yeah. Okay. Um, I did watch something. Thank you for asking. You did ask. I did but ask. But you didn't ask again. Oh my goodness. I'm offended. I did ask. I, I did fighting? watch something. Thank you for asking. Are we fighting? No. <laughs> off off uh off air. Off air, yes. On air, of course not. I watched The Killer. The Killer, what the heck is? Yeah, it's about the killers. <laughs> but just one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Singular killer. Yeah, he's he's <laughs> the funny. killer. Um it's about it's in it's uh, 2023, so this movie just came out, and it's a David Fincher movie. And if that name doesn't ring a bell, let me help ring that bell for you. He has directed such classics as Gone Girl, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, The Social Network, Zodiac. I'm I'm gonna let me just look it up real quick for you guys. It sounds like a horrible director. Those movies are all trash. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, Micah. Okay, buddy. All right, that's good. Good job. <laughs> Time to go home. Uh, seven, Fight Club. Yeah, horrible um, movie. The Game. I have seen that, actually. Yeah, the worst movie ever made. You haven't even seen that, so. I the know. Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Oh, that movie's actually so good. Yeah. Um, I'm just kidding. So, I think I mentioned the best ones at the beginning, but. He did Gone Girl? Yeah. Ugh. I haven't seen that, but you know, Zodiac, amazing, Social Network, amazing, freaking Seven is really good, Fight Club's really good, so he's, you know, he's one of those directors that you get excited for when you hear his movies coming out, um, and he released this with Netflix, apparently he has an exclusive deal for four years with Netflix. How does that work? They're going to be the ones producing his movies for the next... But And he gets to... Um negotiate his contract every time like money wise no they probably negotiated it up front so he's required to make x amount of movies in four years 
Four years is not a long time. To Micah, me. I don't have the contract in front of me. I don't. I can't tell you these details. Didn't you negotiate this deal? No, I was not involved. Why are you talking about it? I just thought it was a fun little thing. You can look it up if you want on your own time and get the details. <laughs> Meanwhile, what is this? The Spanish Inquisition? <laughs> well, I just don't understand why you're talking about it. Am I on the stand? <laughs> Did you not put your hand on the Bible am I about and swear to, in? Am I about to perjure myself? Yes! Well, okay, forget I said it then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about his contract, um, except that there just is wondering. one. I was just giving the people what they wanted. They want to know these answers. Why yeah. didn't you do your research? Listen, I'm not a freaking forensic investigator here. It's uh wow. Figure it out, you know, figure it out. If you want to know the answers, look it up. Okay, fine. For now, all I can tell you is there's some kind of deal. I'm just being left with more questions than answers. Well, that's how I want to leave you. I want I want you to be curious about the subjects. I'm I, just infuriated. Oh, really? I'm so angry. Well, maybe your anger will abate once you look up the answers. I you... will not. Okay. So you're, you're going to be angry off air? Yeah. Okay. We're fighting. Here's this. Here's my prepared statement. Ready? Oh, so you prepared a statement. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Fassbender. Ooh, that's a name probably not everybody's going to know off the top of their head. Let me illuminate you all. Michael Fassbender. Oh, so you're just going to keep ringing all these bells for people? Yep. Michael Fassbender is in The Killer. You might know him from The Killer. <laughs> <laughs> you, might know him from... <laughs> you might know him from the newer Alien movies. He's the creepy android from the newer Alien movies that I haven't seen. Um, he's also young Magneto from X-Men. Oh, also... you don't say. He's also... Let me show you a picture so you can picture him. This is him. Oh, he's Steve Jobs. That's what you've seen him. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so he's the main actor. Okay, back to my prepared statement. Michael Fassbender is a stone-cold assassin, baby. He is methodical, unassuming, and describes himself as unexceptional. He does his work according to a strict set of rules, but when one of his hits goes wrong, its failure trig triggers a retaliation against him that eventually sent, sends him on a quest for vengeance. Along the way, he will break every rule of his mantra as he exacts revenge on those who would hurt him. Is that not a spoiler? No. I don't think so. I don't think it's a spoiler at all. So you know you know that a hit goes wrong. You know that he goes, you know, he's got to deal with his business after the ripples happen, after his hit goes wrong. That's what this movie's about. But what did I like about that about this movie? I don't know why that statement was so hard for me to get to through yeah. without like You wanna try that again? Stuttering. Quest Mantra Slim enough. Slim enough, sir. Slim enough. Be here when I get back. <laughs> be, be here when I get, get back. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> You're not old. <laughs> All right. Um, what did I like about this? I wrote down here a cool opening credit sequence. Always a fan of that. Hmm. So that's a nice, nice thing. Um, he's very methodical. This is something a lot of people have talked about in their reviews of this movie, but a lot of uh, movies that feature assassins kind of feature them as these, like, super badass, like, just... Can do anything. You know, like John Wick, world. right? He He's the prime example of the opposite end of this spectrum. Um, but the, in The Killer, he's very... Like, he's just sitting in an apartment for five days watching where his mark is supposed to show up and it's boring, you know, mm. and he's, and he's just narrating the whole time. And he's like, you need to be able to have a high tolerance for boredom if you're going to be in this job. And do you remember that Brooklyn nine, nine episode where they're boiled? The yeah. Yeah. And they go crazy in that apartment. Yeah. <laughs> they hate each other. Yeah. yeah. So th this, this movie like is very slow. It's a very slow burn. But he's narrating basically the whole time, so 
you know, I really dug it. I thought it was pretty cool. So what cool. does he even have to talk about? Just his job. And, like, the frame he's, of he's mind. He's giving away his trade secrets? Yeah, basically. And what he does. And he, he like, dresses in a very, like, unassuming sort of way because mm-hmm. he doesn't want to be memorable. So he said that he, there's a line where he's like, my outfit is based on a German tourist I saw. Nobody wants to talk to a German tourist, so that's how I dress. Um, and it's he just describes himself as being really unexceptional, but he's very disciplined. He's really good at what he does. There's a fight scene in this in this movie that is freaking awesome. I'm not going to spoil like the situation, but he has to fight someone who's a lot bigger than him. I'm really happy with the way that they did it because if you see like the size difference between these two people. In so many movies, like, tiny people will take punches from opponents that are, like, mm-hmm. 100 pounds heavier than like them. Like me taking a punch from The Rock. Right. It's like and living. You're like, no. Like, you're, you're knocked out after one punch from someone that's that much bigger than you. Yeah. So this, in this fight scene, like, he has to be really quick and, like, get out of the way of these punches because he knows that like he's not going to win a straight up fight against this guy. So yeah, so it's like a very scrappy like really mm-hmm. violent like just awesome. It's really so it felt cool. realistic. Yeah. Um this this movie is also very ambiguous with a lot of the um things that happen. It's one of those movies you can rewatch and discuss with friends. Espe- Am I your friend? Yeah. And you're discussing this with me? Yeah. I'm honored. On air. You're my friend. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. Um, Thank you for distinguishing that. Especially the ending. The ending is like somewhat, it, it'll leave you with questions, but it's not an unsatisfying ending. It's actually a really satisfying ending. Um, I love slow burns like this. The narrator is very interesting. Um, the things he says are interesting. It's just written really well. His narration is written really well. Um, keeps you engaged. It's very tense too at times where you're just like on the edge of your seat. You're like what's going to happen here? What is he going to do? Oh, no, don't do that. You know, that sort of thing. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so I mentioned that he breaks all the rules of his mantra as time, as he goes on his quest for revenge. Um, And one little detail I liked is as he's about to break a rule, you'll hear his voiceover, like, repeat the rule. So one of his rules, for example, is he doesn't take the shot unless his heart rate is under, like, I think it's under 80 or something like that. And that's part of what goes wrong with his original hit is he's waiting to take the shot because his heart rate is too high. And then because he waits, something happens and it makes, it make, sort of makes it all go wrong. Mm. Um, and then there's a part where he's outside of someone's house on his, while he's on his revenge quest or whatever. And you hear his, uh, his voice voice over again he's like never engage unless your heart rate is under whatever 80 and his heart rate is like 165 and then he's like f it and then he like gets out of the car and goes i just sort of liked how because this guy is pretty nihilistic like the things that he says he makes it seem like he doesn't care about anything but because like it became personal for him yeah he actually does care and he's willing to break his rules um, I just thought that was kind of cool. All right, dislikes. When you get right down to it, our protagonist is not a good fellow. He's, you know, he's a stone cold killer, and he kills some people that maybe don't deserve it in this movie. So it's sometimes hard to love these like really cynical, nihilistic David Fincher movies because it's all so grim. It's it's hard to like like the the protagonists of his movies sometimes but this movie just has so much style that i just really dug it famous segment are you ready for it Mm -hmm. killer giblets of knowledge bruh i do not like that word giblets (laughs) why not it's so gross (laughs) (laughs) because it means like all the random parts of a chicken or whatever yeah or turkey or whatever yeah so there is a quote I thought this was interesting. I didn't. I never really got an answer for this question, but at the beginning of the movie, um, when he's setting up his hit, the hit that goes wrong, he quotes Aleister Crowley, who was a like a individualist philosopher, just sort of like it's you know it's all about me, only care about yourself. 
So the quote is, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And the killer quotes this, but he can't remember who the author of the quote was. And I was, I wrote that down because it sounded like maybe that's important that he couldn't remember who it was. I never really got an answer for like why, why he couldn't remember who Aleister Crowley was. I, I haven't thought about it that much, but like. Maybe it's like what you were doing and they just want people to look it up. And you're left with more questions than answers. Yeah, I don't know. I'll think about that more, but I just thought that was interesting. Um, so this is based on a novel, and apparently it has been a 20-year-long passion project for David Fincher to adapt into a movie. Jeez. Yeah, he's been wanting to do this for a while. And originally, he wanted Brad Pitt to play the killer. But Brad Pitt turned it down because it was a little too nihilistic for him. Mm. But I thought, I, I love a good... Uh, appearance of michael fassbender so i was fine i mean either would have been really good yeah. but i was totally fine with who they got all right my rating here it is eight and a half pew, pew, <laughs> out of ten that was that was a silenced gunshot by the way <laughs> i thought it was really good oh parents guide we never did parents guide oh. so for the first movie, um, Living, uh, we mentioned there's a striptease that happens, but it's not... She takes her top off, but you can only see it from behind. Yeah, so it doesn't show anything. There's I actually, no I actually don't even know what it's rated. I think it's rated PG-13. Yeah, you're right. PG-13. Yeah. So it's it's pretty clean. like, And as long as you're cool with a, sl a slow movie, it's very poignant, I thought. Yeah. Do we talk about your book next? My book. The Parents Guide on mine, there is sex. It's not super descriptive, but there is language. And then D&D, &D, PG-13, there is fighting. It's not super violent. There's blood. Yeah. But it's PG-13. It's not horrible. Okay. And there is some language, but they don't, you know, they have a limit on the F word because it's PG-13. Just language like stupid. They say you're stupid. Yeah, you're and not. everyone goes, <gasps> "Yeah, that's the worst insult I've ever heard." My mom says, "You never say that word." <laughs> um, Cuphead is like it's so innocent. Like it just it just is so innocent. It I don't think there's any problem at all with Cuphead. Yeah, but if you are really strict about you never want to themes do anything with like the whole devil theme, then I guess stay away from it. But I just I just think it's it, it's not graphic, it's not bloody, it's not gory, it's just fun. Yeah. Yeah, just really fun in every way. And then the killer is is uh, rated R for sure. Um, it's violent. It's not like over the top violent. Like I think you could probably handle it. Mm -hmm. um, but like when he shoots people, there's blood. You know, when he the fight that happens um, that I mentioned is like pretty pretty brutal but not like over the top it's not as bad as john wick or anything like that okay. yeah just about does it